This is a hobo jungle. Some of these men think of yesterday. Some of them think of today. But only one thinks of tomorrow. And that one is a potential killer. Hello, I'm Charles Bigfoot. I've just been rereading Shakespeare's As You Like It. In it, he says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. A man in his time plays many parts. I'm always amazed at the truths which Shakespeare discovered, but never more so than to find that this particular one applies to a modern police force. For in our story tonight, an officer is told to act a strange role in order to catch a potential killer. A most difficult, dangerous part, which was played by retired officer John J. O'Mara of the Chicago Police Department. Tonight's Man Behind the Badge. Oh, Illinois, like every other big city, has its pastoral settings where the young at heart can dream, quarrel, and make up. On one particular evening in late October, a Mr. Dennis Cannon and a Miss Mary White were patching up the latest of their weekly fights when they were rudely interrupted. Don't scream. Don't even talk. What do you want? I said don't talk. Your money. I want your money. Both of you, put your hands on the steering wheel. You take your right hand off the wheel and give me your money. Put your hand back on the wheel. You can do better than that. My editor wants details. I'm not holding anything back. There have been three Lover's Lane robberies. Every one of the girls have been slugged. And you want me to print the police are working on a new lead. Jerry, it may surprise you to know that I don't give two hoots what you print. O'Mara, oh, I'm a man old before my time. My editor's just looking for an excuse to fire me. Oh, you know you're lying. Your editor's your brother-in-law. I wish you knew as much about this case. So do I, Jerry, but I don't. Most of the kids have been so scared that they couldn't remember anything except the fact that he had dark, piercing eyes. But I wrote that hypnotic angle three times already. So write it again. Did you, did you find any fingerprints? Did you, did you get a plaster cast of a footprint? Anything? Oh, brother, television is ruining you guys. Oh, I get my ideas from Dick Tracy. All kidding aside, O'Mara, I've got to have an angle for this story. This is terrific copy. Young love, uh, a nut on the loose. Yeah, I wish you'd print the fact that the police would be happier if no one used it. This is no joke, Jerry. It's only a matter of time before that guy uses that gun. Look, I'll blow it up big. Only you've got to give me an angle, something new. The public's getting tired of reading about the three robberies. They want something sensational, something exciting. O'Mara, squad room. Okay. Meet you downstairs. What is it? An angle for your public. He just chalked up number four. One step forward. Thomas Devon, age 29, alias Thomas Dean, three arrests for burglary, one conviction. Step back. One step forward. Philip Butte, age 31, alias Philip Underhill, five arrests, burglary, three convictions, being held on suspicion of grand theft auto. Step back. All right, you're next. William Hamburg, age 28, two arrests, burglary, two convictions. You recognize him? I don't know. I've seen so many, I'm confused. Will you ask him to put his hat on? Put your hat on. Ask him to take it off. Now take it off. Well? I'm sorry. I don't think it's any of them. You can let them all go except Underhill. Take him back to his cell. 
I'm sorry, Mr. O'Meara. I want to help, but none of the men we've seen all morning is the one who hit me. I'll recognize him if I see him. Suppose we go back to the squad room, take a look at the mug book. Part of the efficiency of a big city police force are its records. Records of such things as a fingerprint file, case histories, and photographs. Each volume of photographs is arranged in alphabetical order, starting with arson, assault, battery, straight through to hit and run, hold up, robbery, and on to the end of the list of crimes to which man has committed or someday will commit. Mr. Morrow? Yeah. Oh, he's in Joliet, doing 10 to 20. The hair, though, that's the kind of hair he had. Miss, would you mind looking at this picture? This one. Yes, only not quite as receded. Thanks. You may think it's easy to pick out the photograph of a man who threatened your life, but it isn't. After an hour or two, all pictures begin to blur. All the faces seem to take on the same features. I don't think he's in here at all. Probably isn't. It's the beard. All of these men are clean shaven. It makes it difficult. I understand, and I appreciate the help. It's odd how, how hard you try to remember each feature, and yet it's the little things that stick in your mind. It always happens. The eyes, those I remember, and the dirty shirt, and his belt. Belt? Yes, around his waist, there was no buckle. He had it tied in a knot. Captain, this is Amara. No, sir. They couldn't identify him in the lineup or the album. No, sir. But the young lady, she just told me where he lived. It's not a bad idea, O'Mara. It's more than an idea, Captain. It's a certainty. It's been in front of our noses all the time, and we never saw it. The old man's got me ready to buy almost anything. But I'd like to have a few more answers for him when he starts asking questions. Hmm. Four robberies in three weeks. He always has a growth of beard, always has a dirty shirt, the same coat, the same trousers. But he's stolen over $340, which is plenty of money to get a shave. Go ahead. Well, in my book, that makes him a hobo. Yeah. Or a slob. Look, what clinched it for me was the belt. The fact that he tied it in a knot. We'd need about 40 men to cover that jungle. Captain, we get a squad car within 40 miles, and by the time it reaches the jungle, there won't be a hobo closer than St. Louis. Then the only answer is to send one man in. That's what I figured. I don't like the idea of sending one man in there with no protection. Those tramps could smell a cop a mile away. They'd cut him up into small pieces. Well, then the guy has to be able to pose as a tramp. Maybe we could get a stoolie to spot him first. Uh, you'll end up with a dead stoolie. Besides, there isn't one of them would take that job. Uh, you're not very much help. There used to be a vaudeville team. O'Brien and Amara did a comedy act. Both dressed as tramps. Went pretty well on the RPM circuit. So? So, I was Amara. Sir O'Mara knew the risk he was taking, and he was doing everything possible to lower the odds. This was no audition, no benefit performance. He was playing before the toughest audience he could ever face, and he couldn't afford to make one slip. The first thing on the agenda then was to make sure he looked like a tramp, and he knew where to find the outfit. You, stand up. Come on, stand up. Okay. You, stand up. I didn't do anything. Stand up. Uh, it, it, it's untied. You're the one I want. But Captain... Officer, tie the shoelace and come on. I, I didn't do nothing. Not for a couple of days. I mean... Honest, I found it. That's it, Lieutenant. I found it laying right on the sidewalk. What did you find? Huh? What are you looking for? You. Come on.
Just uh, make yourself home, Chester. Maybe I better stand, huh? You know, I, I, I've been picked up a lot of times, Captain, but I never got treated like this. You aren't under arrest. You're in my home. There? Oh, I thought I heard you come in, but I was in the kitchen. Oh, uh, Chester, I'd like to have you meet my wife, dear. This is Chester. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Lieutenant? Oh, I've been promoted and demoted off and on about nine times already. Hello. And all I can say to you is, huh? Oh, uh, Chester and I are about to consummate a big business deal. Yeah. Hmm? The suit, shirt, tie, and shoes. How much do you want for him? Uh, uh, would, uh, would two and a half bucks be... Oh, no, you don't. I'd sell them to you, and the minute I walk out of the house, you arrest me because I ain't wearing pants. I'm getting out of here. Stop or I'll fire. Oh, I bet you've been in half the tanks in the country. All right, Chester, put your hands down and listen. I'll listen, too. I need your clothes. I'll give you one of my shirts, ties, one of my suits, and a pair of my shoes. Is it a deal? Is, is he crazy? He wasn't this morning. All right, is it a deal, yes or no? I don't care if he is crazy. A deal. Come on. Dear. What? In case you are crazy, I care. Oh. He could have changed five times by now. I need his clothes to try on. Are you going to wear his clothes without having them cleaned? Did you ever see a bum with a clean suit? Well, I don't know a great many tramps, but the few I do... Have... <laughs> Hey, that's all right. I'm sorry it took so long. Good Lord. <laughs> Here's a ten dollar bill. Get yourself a haircut and a good meal. Well, thank you, sir. I'm sorry if I was rude before. Well, that's quite all right. Well, good luck, Sergeant. Oh, uh, don't forget to get a haircut. First I'll get a haircut. Then I'll get a job. How about that guy? Oh, John. John? Oh. In answer to your question, you look awful. Thanks. Oh, that makes me feel kind of funny after all these years putting on a makeup tramp outfit. You sorry? Well, O'Brien and O'Mara had too many layoffs for me to be sorry out of show business. Best tramp act in the whole Orpheum circuit. Well, at least that's what we thought. Well, <clears throat> this must be the player. <laughs> oh, it uh, must be the captain. Well, then. Okay. Ooh, honey. Well, I'm forgetting the shoes. You look like a bum. Yeah. You look the part of the mirror. Just make sure you can play it. I'll have to. Oh, uh, dear, would you make us some coffee, please? All right. Still sure you can handle it alone? I'll make it. You know, you could be picked up by one of our own men. Oh, well, I've been in my pocket so it can't drop that. Have you figured out how this crook spent his money? Sure. He's an addict. An addict with a snub nose 32? That can be big trouble. I know. Well, I shouldn't have any trouble getting in, Hobo Jungle. Getting in? I'm worried about you coming out.
just get in? On the freight just went through. Cup of java? Thanks. There are no laughs in the hobo jungle, and very little conversation. These are suspicious, frightened men. Any stranger is suspect. Any question finds a deaf ear. O'Mara had to be careful of every word. Had to talk soft enough not to alarm them, but clear enough to be understood. I uh, just come in from New Orleans. I've been in New Orleans. Tough town. That's why I left. You part of the home guard? Yeah. Me and Shorty have been hanging out here about five years. You don't talk much. That's right. Bull stuff. They're looking for you. Didn't ask that. Tough like any other town. How's the pro, Dad? Couple of diners down the road, you get the meal and two bucks for six hours' work. Just asking in case I need it. Sure. Hobos aren't born suspicious. They acquire it. They think carefully before talking and never volunteer information. Anyone asking a direct question better have a good reason. Or he will either find himself alone or the center of some violent action. O'Mara had a direct question to ask, and had to ask it indirectly. Sometimes I get real hungry. I heard there was plenty around the docks in New Orleans. Not for what I wanted. Boy, I could pay for a small supply, but I, I, I don't know the town. Spend much time in New Orleans? Enough. Someday me and Shorty's going back there. Right, Shorty? O'Mara tossed out the bait, but he wasn't sure what he had caught, or if he'd been the one who was caught. One thing he did know, addicts in the hobo jungle were scarce. The dope habit was expensive, and not one hobo in a thousand could afford it. We don't, neither of us, have nothing to do with the stuff. Don't hang around with nobody who does either. We never seen you before. Well, I, I never spent no time in Chicago. This guy comes around. We think he takes the stuff. Can you hold out a little while? Come on, shorty. He waited for two hours, then he got up and headed for one of the diners down the road. O'Mara knew hobos, knew that they wouldn't give anything away, knew that he had to come up with some solid and liquid trading material. When O'Mara returned from the diner, he brought back six bottles of beer and some sandwiches. His two friends had come back and were waiting. He shared the beer, shared the sandwiches, and waited for them to share some information. Guy come around? No. Sometimes he comes around, sometimes he don't. We don't like him. Carries a short, snub-nosed revolver. We don't have nothing to do with them kind of guys. Make yourself at home. We'll be back. It was now late at night. O'Mara didn't know if he had to wait five minutes, five hours, or forever. All he knew was that he had to wait. Five hours later, and not one hobo had drifted back into the jungle. But finally he heard footsteps that came close. And then the footsteps drifted quietly away. O'Mara knew now that he was not alone. It was now nine o'clock the next night. The silent prowler was still an unseen guest. But was he alone? Did he have friends? If the two hobos had spotted O'Mara as a cop, 
They might have joined the prowler and just be waiting for the right moment to jump him. Or they might have tipped off the addict. They could have done any number of things. None of them to better O'Mara's health. Finally, at 9.45, a figure stepped out of the shadows. This was the man O'Mara was looking for. Only there was a problem. How do you arrest a man who keeps his right hand in his pocket? Keeps a gun trained at your middle. Make yourself at home. Hey, my jungle. A couple of guys invited me in. say you're from New Orleans. I've been there. I know some guys in New Orleans. Who else we work the docks? Well, I was only there a few days. Mostly I drifted around Texas. Ever been to Mexico? Oh, about once every three weeks. Only spent an hour or so. It's time enough. For what I wanted. Got a bottle of beer. I don't like beer. Amara tried to seem casual and unconcerned. He didn't know if he'd been spotted as a cop. All he knew was that he had to get a trigger-happy addict off guard. And it didn't look like an easy job. I, uh, hear you know your way around Chicago. I know what's important to know. Some time since I had some stuff. That's important. Uh, that can be arranged. Well, I, I got some dough. Enough for a small supply, but I don't know where to make a connection. I do. Yeah, you can arrange your meat. Maybe I can do better than that. Maybe I can fix you up myself. Well, I got dope. I want to feel that gun drop in your pocket. Now, slowly. Both hands behind your head. Get up. Just a hobo. For a hobo, you got a pretty interesting sideline. All right, I carry a gun. How about you? I got an interesting sideline, too. I'm a cop. The victims of the Lover's Lane Bandit positively identified him, and he pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 20 years in the state penitentiary. Officer John J. O'Mara received a commendation from his captain and the thanks of the entire city of Chicago for capturing a man who, in his confession, freely admitted that he was fully prepared to kill the first time he was crossed. Service over and above the call of duty becomes second nature to the police of our country. They have a devotion to duty, and their duty is to protect us. So bear in mind, the next time a policeman stops you and gives you a ticket for a traffic violation, he may be the same policeman that you will call upon someday to save your life. And now this is Charles Bigfoot inviting you to be with us next week. Once again, you will see another authentic story of one whose duty it is to serve. A public servant dedicated to you, and whom you will meet as the man behind the badge.